Well, why don't we just begin then? Good morning, yeah. everyone. I'm, I'm Bill Blair. I'm the Minister of National Defense, and I'm joined here this morning by Melanie Jolie, our Foreign Affairs Minister, mm -hmm. and Dan Vandela, our Minister of Northern Affairs, and among many other titles that Dan has. Um, yesterday, we had the opportunity, as you're aware, we, we met with the Northern Premiers, Premier uh, Kegel, Pillai, and Simpson. We gave them an update in a secure environment on Arctic security and Northern security, head of the Northern Premiers Forum. Um, we also discussed at some length issues around climate change and how it's disproportionately affecting the Arctic, which of course is warming four times faster than the global average, and that is making the Arctic far more accessible. And we're seeing much greater activity among our potential adversaries, particularly Russia and China, in the region. Our competitors are exploring the waters, probing our infrastructure and collecting intelligence. And with the introduction of our, our new defense policy, from my perspective, but also a number of really important initiatives and investments that are being made through um, our most recent uh, budget, we think it's very critical that we closely engage with both territorial governments as well as with northerners and local indigenous communities. It, it is essential we hear directly from them on security and defense concerns from my perspective so that we can work together to protect the Arctic and, north and, uh, and the north, and northern communities and peoples here in Canada. Um, we are aware that each of the territories has unique needs, and, and that's why it's important to meet with them all individually, but also collectively. We know that there are significant challenges when it comes to food security, for example, and prices being too high, as well as specific needs when it comes to infrastructure, airstrips, runways, et cetera. And so a very important part of the investment that we've articulated in our national defense policy is going to be investments in infrastructure that is needed in the north. It's, it's, it will do, will do so by creating what we call Northern Operational Support Hubs, but there are other infrastructure investments. In every conversation I've had with Northerners about Arctic sovereignty and about Arctic security, they told me it's really about infrastructure. It's about highways and airports. It's about fiber optics and water treatment plants, medical facilities and housing. It's, it's about building infrastructure in community and in capability. We think there's a great opportunity for us to do that for the Canadian Armed Forces, in what we call multi-use infrastructure. So if we, as we build airport runways, for example, or highways, or we bring in new power plants, or water treatment plants, or medical facilities, or housing, it, it can create jobs, but it also can create infrastructure that will support northern peoples. And, and, and we believe that doing that together is the best way to get it done. So we, we have, we, we, we began a number of years ago, but we're continuing to focus on consultation, collaboration, partnership. And, and so that's that is essentially why we've come here for, for this meeting. Um, the, the premiers, because they are leaders in, in the nation, and, and it's really important for the, the Northern Premiers Forum that, that they were convening that we take this opportunity to come engage, engage with them, share our perspectives, but also learn from theirs. And so I will conclude my remarks. And is anything you wanted to add? Well, yeah, why are we here? Well, I think that the world has changed over the past two years. Uh, we saw it big through Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we also know, and people know in the North, that um, uh, we have lots of allies that are interested in the Arctic, but also uh, more than ever, uh, we are indeed a uh, Russia-fronting country, uh, a neighbor to Russia. We know that Russia and China are also uh, in the Arctic. And so we need to take stock of that. And people in the South don't necessarily appreciate as much as people in the North how much we, this is just Canada's reality. Um, and so that's why we came up with an important document, which is the defense policy update, which Bill was talking about. And now waving around. Mm -hmm. uh, very proud work, <laughs> very good work, which focuses on the Arctic and making sure that we address the security needs uh, of Canadians in the Arctic. That's why also we're here to talk about what can we do diplomatically, and that's much more on my side uh, when uh, uh, dealing with uh, Canada's sovereignty and Canada's security interests in the Arctic. Um, and that's also why we met with the three premiers. Uh, we're meeting with them. I'm meeting with the mayor, meeting with uh, key indigenous organization leaders. Um, and we want to make sure that we hear the perspective of people from the North, because of course, there's a principle that is fundamental to our approach is nothing ab about us without us. But that's, you know, that's definitely at the core of what we're doing. And this is exactly why we're here. Okay. 
Yeah, it's great to be back in Iqaluit. I've been here many times, but it's the first time I've been here with a couple of other ministers, Minister Blair and, and the uh, best Jody. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, Yvonne Jones, Parliamentary <laughs> Secretary to both Bill and myself, so she, she has a, a dual purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, this is, the world is changing. Uh, we've heard about the, uh, uh, the geopolitical, but also the climate is changing. It's changing in the north about four times faster than the rest of the world, and that's incredibly noticeable, brings all sorts of risks, uh, and uh, it's important that, uh, that we're aware of that, and we are. I think when we talk about uh, sovereignty of the North, uh, we're talking really about empowering the people that live here, including, uh, including Indigenous, Inuit, First Nation, and Métis. Uh, we're talking about better housing, we're talking about better infrastructure, dual use, and we're talking about things like clean energy, fiber optic, uh, that uh, people who live here can uh, can enjoy and uh, benefit from. So uh, I just had breakfast with the three premiers. It's, uh, we had an excellent conversation, and we're going to continue those discussions today with uh, different uh, different uh, elected officials and, uh, and the community. So. Great to be here. Merci beaucoup. Canada wants it. We can speak in French. Félix, est-ce que tu veux qu'on parle en français? As-tu besoin d'une introduction? On ne t'entend pas. So. Yeah. T'es sur mute. Okay. We're not. So, Félix, as-tu besoin d'une introduction en français aussi? On te pose la question. Tu es sur mieux présentement. N'hésite pas à te... Bonjour, oui, le son vient d'être activé, donc là, je t'entends. Ah, donc tu pas entendu toute l'introduction? Non, du tout. Oh, <laughs> the entire introduction, he didn't hear because uh, we were on mute. Oops. Um, Okay, I'll just do it in 30 seconds. I'll just do it in 30 seconds. Uh, okay, ben, uh, merci, ça me fait plaisir de vous voir. On est ici, le ministre de la Défense, Bill Blair, le ministre pour la... Euh, être en mesure de, de reconnaître que le monde a changé depuis les deux dernières années à cause de l'invasion de la Russie, à cause aussi du fait que euh, nos alliés et aussi, bien entendu, la Russie, la Chine et euh, d'autres pays euh, qui ne sont pas des alliés euh, sont intéressés par ce qui se passe en Arctique. Euh, et on doit euh, réaliser, on ne réalise pas toujours, euh, nous qui vivons dans le Sud, au nord, euh, nous sommes un pays qui est un voisin de la Russie. Et donc, dans les circonstances, on doit être là pour protéger euh, notre souveraineté. On doit être également être là pour euh, aborder les questions liées euh, à la sécurité de notre pays. Voilà pourquoi le ministre de la Défense est arrivé avec une, une stratégie euh, importante, une nouvelle politique de la Défense qui investit massivement euh, en Arctique. Voilà pourquoi aussi nous avons rencontré euh, les trois premiers ministres des territoires. Euh, nous allons rencontrer aussi des organisations autochtones au cours de la journée. Je rencontrerai le maire également. Et puis, euh, euh, nous allons continuer à faire ce travail-là. De mon côté, euh, je travaille aussi beaucoup sur euh, comment on, on s'engage diplomatiquement sur la question de l'Arctique. Donc, vous voyez que c'est vraiment une priorité euh, pour, euh, pour notre gouvernement. Euh, et euh, il y a un principe de base lorsque on, on parle avec les organisations autochtones, c'est jamais euh, euh, en anglais on dit nothing without us, uh, about us without us. Donc euh, jamais euh, parle-t-on, travaillons-nous sur des enjeux sans que les organisations soient impliquées. I think something went wrong. It's written. It's written. Looks like something went wrong. So I think it's. Uh, while we work yeah. with Felix, why don't we okay. just carry on? Yeah. yeah. And, and so we'll, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have for us. <clears throat> yeah, so Northern o Operational Hubs. Um, I was hoping you could get more into detail on exactly what they are and how they differ from you know, your operational 
hubs or bases uh, across the world. I know you, you have some of those as well. Yeah. Well, we're, we're investing in, in, in a number of new capabilities for the Canadian Armed Forces and things like new aircraft, um, surveillance aircraft, it, it, AWOX multi-mission aircraft, and a new fleet of tactical helicopters. Um, in order to project that capability into the north, we're going to have to establish new new hubs. It's not just for the aircraft, of course, but it's also places where we can stock by all, uh, supplies and goods, where we can operate from and, and, and train from. Um, cause we have already un undertake a number of significant uh, training opportunities with ourselves and with our allies in, in Canada's north. But we've identified the need, because it, it, it's a vast uh, swath of territory, to establish five new uh, support hubs. And they will require places where we can land our planes, for example, hangars where we can maintain them and store spare parts. It will, it will require that we make other investments in, in those facilities, such as a power, a power supply, reliable and, and, and a safe water supply, fiber optics for communications. There's a number of pretty significant investments. We don't think that, that we get the real value from those investments unless we make it multi-use. And so I think it's really important, and that's one of the things we're engaging in now, is coming up here and speaking to the people who live in northern communities, the northern uh, premiers who represent them, the large indigenous and indigenous organizations, um, but also in communities as themselves. And to, we, we are determining where we need to place these, but that has to be done in consultation with the people who live here so that we can maximize the benefits of both the people that live here, because I think that's a great opportunity, but also create a new capability for the Canadian Armed Forces to be persistently present and resilient and strong in the Canadian Army. Follow up on that, if you don't mind. Um, so you mentioned multi-use. Could you give some exa other examples of what multi-use would mean to the community? Um, is this space for events? Is this no? I, I think it, it gets a little more practical than that. Like if we're, going, if we're going to have to build an airstrip that I can I can land a, a fighter jet on or a transport plane, that airstrip can then be accessible to the people who live in those communities to bring in goods and services, to do medical evacuations, uh, frankly, to improve the quality of, of their life. And that's just a single example. <coughs> we are going to bring in some roads to support that. Those roads would be available to, to the people that work there. It, it's also an opportunity, I think, if we do this right, to create real economic prosperity and jobs mm -hmm. for people in the North who will help us build this infrastructure and help us maintain it. I'm also well aware, we've, in, in addition to the, in, to the support hubs, I had an opportunity to meet yesterday with, with Canadian Rangers. They are an incredible asset. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're terrific. And the work that they do, they, they know the land, they live in the communities, mm -hmm. um, they have millennia of, of uh, experience and, and history and, and knowledge that they can bring to creating a more sovereign and, and strong nation. But as I, I spoke to them, they're also remarkably resilient on their own, but there are things we need to invest in them as well that will benefit both them and the communities in which they live. Could you give some examples of what those investments would be? Well, we, we, we talked about the capability. And for example, we just gave them new rifles. But you know, I met with them yesterday, and they were showing me rather proudly some of the, like the, the all-terrain vehicles and, and snowmobiles that, that, that we are able to provide them, because their mobility is critically important. Um, it, it, it's an extraordinary combination of traditional knowledge and modern technology. That, and when we, when we leverage the value of both together, I think we can make them uh, even more effective in all of the work they do. They are, for us, in many respects, the eyes and ears. And, and you know, we talk about maritime, installing ma maritime sensors and putting and boats in, in the newly opening um, Arctic waterways. And, and all of those investments are important, but having people with their eyes and ears and knowledge of what's, what, what may be out of place is also really critically important for us to maintain a safe and secure envir environment in the Arctic. And so engaging with them, building their organization, making sure that they've got the, the, the tools that they need to do the job and the supports that they require is, is an important part of the strategy as well. Mm -hmm. If I could add to that. Please. Um, I think it's the first time that there is a defense policy that puts so much emphasis on Northern Rangers and their role. Uh, and in that sense, I think that's a novelty in the defense policy. Of course, the defense policy is about the Arctic, per se. That's a, the important aspect of this defense policy. But of, at the core of our defense is the work of the men and women that are these Northern Rangers that we're so proud uh, to be supporting and empowering. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, the, the, the Arctic policy that you have in front of you, R&R &R Strong and Free, 
it, it's a very broad policy. It talks about all the requirements and, and, and ships and planes and surveillance capability and offensive capabilities and defensive capabilities for the Canadian Armed Forces. But I think uniquely for this document, we've focused very strongly in continental defense, in, in the defense of Canada, yeah. in fulfilling our obligations even to our international partners in the United States and to NORAD or exactly. through our NATO partners. Uh, the, the northern frontier of NATO and continental defense to our partners in the United States is critically important and we are really turning our mind and our investments towards that responsibility to defend Canada and to strengthen our own resilience. And, and I think when we talk about sovereignty, to assert sovereignty um, over your, your territory means you have to be persistently present and quite frankly it also needs, means that in, in wind challenge you have to be able to defend it. Yeah, and the threats are, evol are in evolution, so you need to be able to address the new threats. Mm -hmm. It also means the, p the people who live here have to be fully engaged. They have to be uh, certainly safe. They need to be thriving and strong, and they need to be, they need to be healthy. So I think, uh, again, emphasis about what we're doing is uh, what's in the documents incredible, but at the same time, uh, we're going to be investing in housing and in infrastructure and in, uh, in, uh, in fiber optic, these quality of life things, I think, which will make sure uh, that the people living here are, are healthier and uh, are fully, uh, fully engaged in what's happening in their communities. Mm -hmm. I would like to follow up on that, but just to tie up the Northern Operational Hubs, mm -hmm. um, I heard in a, a recent article you can't say exactly where yet these five will be. Do you have any update on where and when these hubs uh, will be operational? I can share with you the process by which we'll determine where they're required. The, f the first will be an analysis by the Canadian Armed Forces based on their defensive requirements as to where they need to be located. There are issues of geography and, and proximity to certain other resources that are relevant to that discussion. But, but that's only the beginning of the process. We are going to engage with, with Northern Premiers. We're going to engage with Indigenous organizations, and we're going to engage with, with Northern communities. I, 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 th these are important investments, and we want to make sure that we maximize the benefit of these investments, <coughs> not just to CAF, but, but, but to Canadians. And, and so that, that, that will be the process by which we determine where they are required. Ultimately, the Canadian Armed Forces will tell us where they need to be where they need to deploy the best, and for example, there's a, some analysis that's taking place on, you know, distances to get their fighter jets to certain uh, calls to, to service that, that, that they may have. Even the deployment of the new tactical helicopters, there we have to take into consideration our responsibilities to search and rescue. Um, there, there are a number of considerations that will be <coughs> taken into account. That process is now underway. They, they, the Canadian Armed Forces just got told that they're going to have the money to do this. And so the work will begin. And I've made it very clear to them that that work cannot be done in isolation from the people of the North. Mm -hmm. On infrastructure, unless someone else wants to jump in. Um, yeah, for infrastructure, as so you mentioned, housing, uh, fiber optic, two things that are much wanted in the North. Um, do you have examples of how these, this, this very large policy will provide that and when? Yeah, I'm going to turn this over to Dan because I think he'd probably have a lot more insight into a number of those things. I don't think this policy can be looked at in isolation. It is, it is our new defense policy. It speaks to significant investments in the North, but it also has to fit in with a number of other policy statements that have already been established, mm -hmm. tables that have been set. Mm -hmm. There's already significant work underway, and for example, issues around housing and transportation and, and health and, and, and fiber optics and, and, and rolling that out right across the north. All of that work is already well underway. That, that, this document is intended to fit into the context of, of our national approach to, to building a stronger and more resilient north. It, it doesn't stand alone. It stands, it stands very much mm -hmm. in the context of all of that other work. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think it's important that this, this document actually references the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, which which guides all of the work that I've been doing over the last few years, and that the premiers and the indigenous leadership, political leadership, and communities have been doing. On housing, we know that's the issue I that gets brought up the most often, is we need better, safer housing, more affordable housing, and we're working, we're fully engaged with the three premiers, with uh, indigenous leadership, 
We uh, have a $4 billion urban, rural, and northern indigenous housing that's being rolled out as we speak. I'm working with uh, Minister Fraser on that. Uh, there's going to be a, a northern carve out for that. Previous budgets have, uh, have invested uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in indigenous housing. Uh, we've got uh, at least 800 million in Inuit Nunengat for housing over, that was in the 22 budget. And there is other bilateral relationships between uh, Minister Fraser and the three territories. Uh, same thing as infrastructure. Uh, we talked about the Mackenzie Highway this morning at breakfast. We talked about taking stock of what we've invested to date and what actually needs to be invested in, in, uh, in further budgets. Uh, that's not in this uh, uh, northern uh, strategy per se, but it's in other Government of Canada. It could be in other uh, Government of Canada uh, budgets. Uh, we know it's important, but we're working with the Premiers. We're working with Indigenous leadership to identify exactly uh, what, uh, what the priorities are. So the priorities are up to people who live here to decide, and we co-develop the policies. Mm -hmm. And um, on to the defence side, um, specifically climate change. As mentioned uh, before, Russia, China, and I guess um, what was probing, but um, collecting intelligence. Do you guys have examples of that already happening because of climate change in the North? Yeah, there are examples. We shared some of those yesterday with the North Korean Premiers in a secure briefing. Can't speak a lot of, to the details, but what I can tell you is with climate change, we are seeing the North becoming far more accessible than it was previously, and we could anticipate, I think. And it, it, it has been speculated that by 2050, the Arctic Ocean could become the main route of transit between Europe and, and, and Asia. Um, and, and given those changes, given the, and, and it's, climate change is really relevant here because it is making the area more accessible, but techno technological advances are also impacting that accessibility. And so through space technology, through other forms of, of aerial and marine surveillance um, and data collection through, through cyber systems, we are seeing more assertive action on behalf of potential adversaries like Russia and China clearly are demonstrating a strong interest in the North, leaning in, as it were. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I want to make sure that through our defense policy and other significant investments we, we make, that, that we are strong here. And so people will understand that there is certain risks inherent for them imposing and challenging our sovereignty in the North. Um, in order to do that, you have to build infrastructure. You have to be persistently present. You have to be strong. And not just strong from a military standpoint, but strong for health and housing and in, in our communities. And, and so it really is a, a whole of Canada approach to creating a, a, a more sovereign nation, particularly in the Arctic. And it is in response to, to the changing environment. And, and climate change is a hugely significant impact, uh, impactful factor on that. But there are other factors as well. And, and we've also seen. Um, through the activity, particularly the Russian invasion in Ukraine. That Russia is quite prepared to abandon the well-established rules-based order that we have lived by for 80 years and, and just impose their will. And, and we see a different approach, quite frankly, from, from China, where you know, they're buying their way into influence and, and power in, in a lot of parts of the country. And we, we are concerned about you know, their intent on that, and we want to make sure that we are strong at home. And so all of the investments we've spoken about is, are, 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 I think, critical. Now, I was in, in uh, Yellowknife last week, and people asked me, is this defense policy? Is it, intent, is it your intent to build the Alaska Highway with this? Or, the, excuse me, the Mackenzie Highway. And, and, and the reality is, I really support the Mackenzie Highway. I think that will be important infrastructure to def the defense of the Arctic. But that's not in this policy. It's a discussion for the government departments. Mm -hmm. All right, if I could build on that. I think for a long time we thought that when it came to the Arctic, it was high north, low tension. That's not the case anymore. And that underpins this entire defense policy update. Because, like I said, Russia's invasion <coughs> of Ukraine changed things. For a long time we thought that, for example, through the Arctic Council, we could work with the eight Arctic countries. And it was all about making sure that we would be working amongst Arctic nations to talk about the Arctic. Now, the Arctic Council has not met at the political level since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, so more than two years. 
And that is why we have to take stock of that and we need to react. We need to do two things. We need to make sure that we continue to engage diplomatically with all the seven other Arctic nations. And we're working on different plans on that. And we need to work on deterrence. And that's why the defense policy update. Uh, so when you were saying, are you seeing China, Russia, etc.? There is cooperation happening between both. Uh, China has said that they uh, see themselves as an Arctic state. We don't think that they have uh, uh, the credibility nor the knowledge uh, to be uh, seen as an Arctic state. Uh, we believe that uh, Canada is a strong one, and that's why we're investing in our leadership. And at the same time, uh, as I said at the beginning, we need to uh, really understand and that we are a nation that is neighbor to Russia. And Russia has invested in its north and, so, and its different capa uh, capabilities in its north. That's also why we need to continue to have a competitive edge. That's why the minister uh, has invested in the modernization of NORAD. Uh, in the past and also that we're coming up with this defense policy because we think that within North America, with the U.S. Uh, and also the six other Arctic states, um, five other Arctic states, which now Sweden and Finland are part of NATO, we have a very strong uh, group of, of allied countries defending our own part of the Arctic. Yeah, that, that was a point I wanted to make as well. It's not just about the activities of our adversaries, but for our allies as well. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, we all recognize we have a collective responsibility. Canada is <coughs> stepping up to fulfill its responsibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's sort of something I wanted to touch on, actually. Yeah. Um, how do the external or foreign policies complement, uh, you've already sort of touched on this, but uh, the, the national defense policies, mm -hmm. especially when you're looking at something that people would say are, are people who might not know, um, might not say are seem terribly relevant, like sending uh, 2,200 troops to Latvia, but we know it's critical to maintaining NATO. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah, well, of course, the f you know, the defense policy update mm -hmm. is based on a foreign policy mm -hmm. assessment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's why we both have a message, you know, uh, <laughs> at the beginning of the defense. I, I would point out that, that, that both myself and the Minister of Foreign Affairs um, uh, introduced this document, yeah. uh, quite honestly, and this is something Melanie and I have talked about many times. Yeah. Defense policy is foreign policy. That's it. So defense policy, by the way, is also industrial policy. And I think because of the things we talk about, it's also a national policy. But it fits in with foreign policy, and it fits Indeed. in with industrial policy, and it fits in with the national policy. Um, we're just we're we're finding the appropriate place for for the defense discussion in the context of those other really important discussions in Canada. Yeah, and Gira, just to uh, follow up on your question, while Bill is working on the implementation now of the defense policy update, on my side, I'm working on an approach on how we'll engage diplomatically. So I'm doing the work on making sure that. Diplomatically, we have our Arctic bound, you know, borders, boundaries clear. We just had uh, a historical deal with Denmark a year and a half ago where we settled the Hans Island issue. We settled the maritime border with Greenland, Denmark, um, which is the longer, longest maritime border between two countries in the world. We need to address the Beaufort Sea. We need to make sure that uh, you know, we have our claims on the continental shelf um, uh, protected and recognized. We need to address the Northwest Passage. We need to address the Arctic Council. So these are different aspects of the foreign policy on the Arctic that we're working on. And that's also why I'm meeting so many different indigenous organizations and also uh, uh, the, the three premiers. So he, we're all building on each other's work um, when you, Dan was referring to the Arctic framework, which Dan has worked on, Yvonne has worked on also. In the Arctic framework, there's an international chapter. That international chapter was done in 2019. That was before the inv Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's outdated. We need to update it. Can I just add something? For 120 years, 130 years, 
Almost all of the work of the Canadian Armed Forces has been expeditionary. We've sent our troops to other lands to help win wars and, and to keep the peace. Um, and, and the world has relied on Canada to do that. And, and, and Canada has made significant contributions throughout its history in that regard. But we also believe that in order to, because the world is changing, if you're going to be strong for your allies abroad and around the world, you've got to be strong at home. Yeah. And, and that's really an acknowledgement that, you know, that we, we have also thought, I think for a very long time, that we were, we were protected by our geography. We we're surrounded by yeah. three oceans, one of which is mostly frozen, or at least has been in the past. We are next door to a very powerful but very benign ally and neighbor. I mean, we've relied on, on their strength as well in the past. But we have our own responsibilities, and, and frankly, asserting our, our sovereignty, defending our country, has to be job one. I was reminded when I got this job that I'm Canada's Minister of National Defense. And the first job is to make sure that Canada is strong and secure and resilient. And, and, but I don't think that diminishes our capacity to, to be there for our allies as well when we are required. And that's why we step up in Latvia and we step up in NATO and why we're also working hard in the Middle East and in, 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 in the Indo-Pacific. Um, there's, there's, the world is, is an increasingly dangerous place and Canada has to do its part and will. But, but as I've, I've had many conversations with our allies, and they understand completely our responsibility to defend our country and our continent first. Sorry, we have just a couple minutes left, and before we do conclude, I just want to turn to anyone on the phone. Uh, so those, those who are on the line, did you have any questions you want to put to us, and, and Felix in particular, if, if for Radio Canada, if, oh, if you wanted something? Oui, bonjour. J'avais. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? Oui, on t'entend très bien. Super. La connexion coupe euh, un petit peu. J'ai manqué euh, quelques phrases, mais on, je, vais, je vais essayer que vous m'entendiez. Donc, euh, question pour Monsieur Bouchard, euh, spécifiquement sur la, la, les infrastructures de, de nanistique sur l'île de Barbin. Euh, il y a eu plusieurs réductions de budget dans les dernières années qui vont réduire, selon la vérificatrice générale, la capacité de ravitaillement en des navets. Et je me questionnais à savoir euh, si un ami civique allait être inclus dans cette, euh, cette nouvelle stratégie et euh, si euh, elle va répondre aux besoins. Minister, a question coming to you on Nana Civic Naval Facility. In the past couple of years, we've seen reports from the Auditor General saying that more funding will be needed while your government is decreasing funding. Is there anything in this plan for Nana Civic and how will you address this issue? Yeah, it, it, I, I keep on reading about the government decreasing funding. And in fact, with, with, our, with the work that we were doing previously in Strong, Secure, and Engaged, the new investments we're making through our North, through North Strong and Free, the defense budget actually increases by 27% next year over this year, which is a historic and unprecedented. Uh, increase in defense spending. The challenge, of course, is making sure that we spend those harder Canadian taxpayer dollars well. And that means consulting with the people engaged and learning from the experience and, and the requirements of the Canadian Armed Forces and then going out and getting the job done in the most cost-effective way possible. And so that's all the work that's underway right now. And I, I take very seriously all of the, the auditor reports that, that, that are available to us. We've got a big job to do, and it's why we, br we brought forward a new defense policy and why we're making historic investments in Canada's national defense. Mr. Felix. I've got a question that has to be asked. Um, you know, Canada's defense policy or federal government coming up north to defend our borders, the history with that here has been fraught. I think mm -hmm. we can admit Greece Fjord and Resolute Bay are examples of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. How is your nothing without us, without us, how is that policy, how does that have substance? How does that ensure that it's more than just conversations? making sure that you are working with the new organizations with the governments of in this region? First of all, the past is prologue. I think we, we should always remember our past, and we should be very cognizant of the mistakes that were made in the past. And, and you, you cited two, and I think there are great lessons for all of us in that, that it never be repeated. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've been working very hard to do, and I think Dan can probably give you more information from his perspective, we have been working hard with Northern Indigenous leadership, uh, organizations and communities and also with the Northern Premiers to really set a table where we can come and consult in, in, in consultation and 
really need really needs the next step of consultation is collaboration and then partnership. We have to work together. We have to listen and respect each other's points of view. Um, that that work is is well underway, and I benefit from that because I'm bringing a new defense policy. Um, I don't have to, to reinvent those engagements and those processes. So many of them have been so well established already in the past few years by our government, and and they are working. And, and for example. We're indigenous organizations, Inuit organizations are coming to Ottawa next week. That's the third time I will have been at that table. I've had different board portfolios, but th that table is a really useful place for us to engage in, in these conversations and, and to, to apply the lessons of our history. Um, one, one of the things that we, I even, I will share with you, as we were putting a title on this particular document, Our North, I was concerned that for some that that would be traumatic and because of of, of some of the colonial approaches that we have taken in the past. But, but I think it, I've gone to those tables now and I've explained to people what we were referencing and, and that the, Canada was taking responsibility for its history but also for the future and that we recognize that all Canadians, you know, Indigenous, Northern, all Canadians, have a, have a responsibility to make sure that we get it right this time. And, and it, 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 these are challenging processes, and there's never enough money or enough time, but together we will create the best possible outcome for the people of the world. And David, the number one thing in the defense policy uh, that we're investing in is people. So to your point, because we believe that our people, our northern rangers, for example, are the ones that will be there to help us. That's why we refer to the importance of the Northern Rangers, and that's why the three of us met. Yeah, yeah and, and I really think there's been a significant change in, in how we, the agreements we have with Indigenous nations. Uh, for example, next week we have the Inuit Crown Partnership Committee meeting in Ottawa. Uh, once, last year we were in Nain, actually, where we spent a few days talking to, to uh, Inuit leadership uh, about their priorities and uh, it's a, um, next week we have uh, four hours where the Prime Minister and there's about six or seven ministers will be present to talk about their priorities and how we can uh, move on their priorities and how we can set budgets that's that's never occurred before in the history of Canada uh, we have government to government relationships now with all Indigenous governments, whereby mm -hmm. I mentioned we've invested uh, $800 million with uh, an Inuit Nunagat. That Those aren't grants. Those are agreements where uh, money is transferred to the uh, Inuit governments and they invest it. They don't have to apply for it. They don't have to, uh, they don't have to, uh, uh, to report to the federal government on how they're spending it. Those are real agreements, government to government. And that's just an example of the sea change that's occurred uh, on how we, we approach the north and how we approach our, our relationship with indigenous peoples. Now that's wider than that because it's the entire territory, the entire north, but I, I, think, uh, I, I think that's significant. There's a reason why for the very first time Canada's national policy talks, talks so much about the north and talks so much about infrastructure. It's because that's what the people of the north told us was important. For sure, for sure. Um, do you have any, just quick follow-up, do you have any examples of how that consultation created something in this policy? Whether it's uh, a spending or investment? Well, the, um, if I may, I think the, the investment in multi-use infrastructure, as we talked about in, in the past, <coughs> we have built, um, I, I, was, I was speaking to the NTI uh, president this morning, and, and she said, oh, we always knew when a federal building was being built in Galloway, it's a blue building. And, and, and frankly, there's, that's a very profound thing to say to me. And, and what, what I think she was telling me, and what I certainly learned from, from her remarks, is that we should be sitting down with them right from the get-go before we decide what building and where and what, what function it will have and how it will serve the country. We also have to talk about how it will serve the people. And, and I think that's, that, that, that was a useful observation. And I, I can tell you as well, I've come here to the north many times in other capacities, and, and you know I, I've, I've, I've the perspective of somebody from Toronto, and so I my perspective on what constitutes Arctic sovereignty and Arctic defense 
was based on you know, a, a very limited perspective. But when I came here and I met with Northerners, overwhelmingly, they talked about infrastructure and they talked about people. And frankly, I've taken that back. And when, when, when my team and I sat down to, to write this defense policy, we did, that, was, that was the guiding principle. And what they had told us was required. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you.